1950s when rock and roll swept across the Atlantic and took us all by storm. It created new stars, new heroes, and a whole new outlook on life. Well, over the years, many of those names have become lost in the mists of time, but not all. From a symbol of rebellious youth in the 50s to the sophisticated performer of today, Cliff Richard is a pop phenomenon who's presently enjoying that rare accolade, the subject of four documentaries presently being broadcast on BBC Two on Monday evenings. Well, now coming up to his quarter century in the pop world, if you thought he hadn't changed a bit over the years, here's a short reminder of that 50s image. Ladies and gentlemen. Have you lost have you lost the art of quivering the lip? I don't know no, too much these days. I don't know what it was. I, I think it was the way the fact that you we tried to be as American as possible, I suppose, in those days, because the whole rock and roll phenomena came from over there. So if you want to say, oh, 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 it sort of went like that. <laughs> I mean it wasn't it, it just the way rock and roll singers mm. tended to look and I had that kind of overall image that Elvis had in fact had set as the kind of prototype. Mm. How does it feel for you, working on these documentaries, looking through the past, as I said, it's nearly a quarter of a century, it's horrifying <laughs> well, for me, it's not anyone else. <laughs> well, it felt really good. I mean, the first show, which has already been screened now, uh, is, the, is the only one that is historical, if I can use that, that term. Because obviously, um, we wanted to sort of talk about, but by the way, they're not really, uh, I mean, I know they are documentaries, but what we tended to do was do four live shows, and use a documentary style of presentation because I've always said to my band and bands know this that in fact we can easily entertain by doing what the public know that we do do like sing and play and uh, that's fairly easy but when it comes to television it's another whole media and I thought how do we how do we interest people how do we let them know what it's like to be us really because you can talk about it in the press and of course the press don't always tell the truth anyway so in the end people still have this big question mark like what is it really like so we did the historical bit with that first thing and let people know how I got started, what my influences were, what other people thought, and, um, and the rest mm. of the shows, the other three are, are uh, not quite as historical. They're much mm. more comments on what I'm doing at the moment. Well, certainly the first one was very successful. I enjoyed it very much. But let me ask you, was there a particular point in those early years when you thought, that's it, I've got it, this is my, you know, you, you've made it? No, there were more times when I thought, that's it, I've lost it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because... <laughs> it was pretty obvious from the beginning that you couldn't actually guarantee a hit. My first record, you see, went to number two in the charts. And, uh, and I had, I mean, I, with Nori Paramore, I had a really fantastic string of successes. I mean, of all the producers I've used, he's given me more successes than I've ever had in my life. Um, but it started with Move It, Nori produced it, and it went to number two in the charts. Now, if you follow the trend, the next record was called High Class Baby, and it was another... <laughs> And it went to, I think, nine in the charts. Then the third single went to 17. So it, it, isn't, it wasn't all roses. And when we look back, you can say, hey, exciting days, because I made it through all that hard time. But it was definitely a downward trend. And regardless of whether it was rock and roll or not, just singing rock and roll was not a guarantee of having a hit. And then Living Doll happened, and it took off in another direction, really. Well, I wonder, you, you talk about problems with the press, uh, often saying misleading things, but... Uh, not just the press, what was it like, what were the effects on you of the reaction of the public, of all the girls screaming and having hysterics and this type of thing? Uh, it must have been fun at it first, but did it get you down after a while? No, night? it was wonderful. <laughs> I mean, you know, I left school when I was 16 and a half, and I just worked for a year in an office doing uh, what I guess a lot of people do. And uh, so with just one year out of school, I suddenly had a record contract. And when I was at school, the big people were the Elvises and... And, and you dreamed of, of having that kind of effect on people. So when it finally happened, you know, we went on stage with the Shadows and I, and kids would scream. It was, well, it was very nice. I mean, it really was quite fantastic, and I couldn't believe right the way through about three or four years that it was actually taking place, because I'd never considered myself to be another Elvis. The press tried to set up this whole thing about, well, here is Britain's answer to Elvis. The only connection was that we both had similar effects on different audiences. I could never replace Elvis. He's irreplaceable. The guy was the prototype. He was the first. 
And regardless of whether or not some of us have made as good a record, or sometimes maybe even a better record, you will never replace the originator. And he set the pace for what we have now. But uh, as a result of what you're saying, you've now become the only Cliff Richard. And you've got another hit. Can I saw you on uh, Top of the Pops last night. Yeah. I think you've got a big hit coming up for Christmas. Well, I hope so. If someone doesn't bring out a really gooey Christmas song, I could possibly get in the top five again. <laughs> <laughs> Do you enjoy it still? What, making records? Yes, after uh, all these years. It's the better now. You know, Jack Good was, a, was on my show on Monday saying, oh, it's all boring now, the public are boring, and uh, he was very controversial. <laughs> he said the Bee Gees were boring, and of course, I totally disagree with everything he said, but it was great viewing. I, I enjoyed disagreeing with him. Well, I don't find it boring. No, and I don't. I think it might be rather fun at this point to remind ourselves of that first hit that you mentioned, Move It. We're going to show you now, but singing it as Cliff Richard now in the, in the 1980s, but it's still just as good as it ever was. <laughs> Here you, it is, thanks. coming up now. people of what the uh, the prizes are and really rather splendid they are because uh, we have a motor car which I'm sure you saw at the beginning of the show that uh, rather splendid uh, tall be tall but sunbeam now there are two of these in fact because not only does the winning nurse get one of these so does the sponsor and that's really quite something so two Talbots to be driven away from Pebble Mill today the winner will also get 1,000 pounds and will be given the right to uh, use 500 pounds to send to a charity of their choice or perhaps to a uh, nursing department or something of that kind. That is up to the winner to do. The uh, second prize, in fact, is 500 pounds. And also, and let us not forget, gleaming behind me here is the Dettel Sword. Now, that sword will, in fact, be presented and perhaps hang in the foyer of the hospital of the winning nurse. So that's uh, been held and manipulated there by the managing director of Reckitt and Coleman, John Wells. John, thank you very much indeed. And now we come to the moment of truth. Great uh, tension building up here now in the lobby. I've got the envelopes in my hand here, the gold envelopes carrying the name. I do not know who the winners are. Very few people here except the judges know, but uh, one man who will be revealing that in just a moment. Will you welcome back again, Cliff Richard. <laughs> Okay. You can put them all out of their misery. This is, in fact, in the usual reverse order, okay. the runner-up. Right. We'll announce the name. Oh, runner-up is Sue Lee. <laughs> Sue Lee. Well done indeed, Sue. If you just stay with us, and now yeah. the real moment of tension. Everyone holding their breath. The winner is Anne Lloyd. I'm, I'm supposed to interview you now. I don't think we're going to make it, are we? <laughs> how, how do you feel? I think they've got the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. It's, it's an overwhelming experience, isn't it? But wh what do you think you're going to do? One thing, let's, let's talk a little bit of, let's look just quiet sense for a moment, because apart from that splendid thousand pounds and the car, you've also got 500 pounds in your own gift, so to speak, yes. to distribute. Where do you think you might, uh, I know you probably haven't thought about this, what might you do with that 500 pounds? Well, as it's been obviously um, spoken, there's been cutbacks, and I work in a very, very, uh, uh, high-priced uh, speciality 
um, and I like to use it to some equipment, uh, particularly to benefit, obviously, our patients. Um, that the hospital probably couldn't afford to buy, so... <laughs> Good, well, that's, that's splendid. And um, I know exactly how you feel. I feel like I'm a wee bit of a bore myself. <laughs> could, could I just say yes, something? Please, yes, please. I'd like to thank everybody in the gastroenterology unit. They've been absolutely marvellous. And particularly uh, my mother and my sister, who were, my mother's not well enough to be here today, who have encouraged me throughout the help of my nursing career. So. Well, splendid. And congratulations to our nurse. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, many, many congratulations, and uh, we're really absolutely all delighted. I hope you'll be able to join us on, on Monday, when we'll all, I hope, be recovered and dry-eyed again. But we're going to go out with a, a blaze of music now, with uh, the Sid Lawrence Orchestra and Manhattan Spiritual.